Tony, it's a pleasure to have you here and to appear before uh, our cameras and talk a little bit about you and your exciting life. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Tony. Running a club in uh, it was in the uh, East Dundee, Illinois, right outside of Chicago, about 47 miles. And everybody would come in there. It was a hangout for everybody. Everybody that knew anybody in crime was there. And one of the persons that happened to be here was Tony Splatro, who was a very good friend of mine. And he came to me one day and he says, uh, Tony, uh, we're going to Vegas. And I says, going, we're going to Vegas for a vacation? He says, oh, no, we're going to Vegas to stay. I said, I got a business. I can't. He said, we'll sell it. I said, sell it? Yeah, just sell it. Don't worry about it. We'll take care of it. So I sold it. In 1970, I was out in Las Vegas. And I've been here ever since. And um, did my stuff for Tony. Did some work for him. Did a lot of work. Drove him around. Was his driver at the tail end of his life. Uh, I owed, he invested money in different operations. And I went in there and built them because to watch for his money and see that he got an honest count and a good business. You watched for his money? Yeah, like exact uh, when he put money in the Villa Diesta, he loaned them a hundred thousand to keep the Villa Diesta open, and I was put in there. He brought me in from Seattle. He sent me to Seattle prior to that, then brought me back, and brought me over the uh, Villa Diesta, and he uh, met Joe Pig, and uh, and then we were sitting down there, Joe Pig Nutella, and um, he introduced me. He said, "Tony, do you know Joe?" I said, "Yeah, I know Joe," and. Um, he said, Joe, this is Tony, and uh, Tony's going to watch my money, and he's the only person that he answers to is me. Is uh, you happy with that, Joe? And Joe said, sure. So you're talking about the Villa DS that was portrayed in the movie Casino, sort right. of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's where uh, Joe Pesci, in, uh, who played the part of Spilatro, Correct. and Lefty Rosenthal met a few times. Correct. And uh, that it was... was Every celebrity in the country was there. That was the place in Las Vegas, wasn't it? Yes, because uh, the way I got the story when I got here, these hotels never had a gourmet restaurant in them. They had coffee shops. And uh, Joe Pig was here in the 50s, and he would say, they want gourmet gourmet, gourmet food. They have to leave the hotel to come to this, to uh, Villa Diesta because there was no Italian restaurants in the hotels at that time. They were just coffee shops. Most of them were all motels. They weren't really hotels at that time. Did he build that restaurant? No, it was uh, it was called the Coach and Six. And uh, the way I got the story is Johnny Drew was running it, who used to work at the Stardust, and he's from Chicago as well. And he was running the uh, Villa Diesta. And then uh, one day, Joe drove uh, Mooney. He was they were in Vegas. Because uh, Mooney was having an affair with Phyllis McGuire. Mooney being? Sam Giancana. And uh, they went to get some good Italian food. And uh, Sam says, come on, I'll take you to a place. And he took Joe and Sam. They drove over to, uh, well, Joe did the driving over to, uh, which we now know as uh, Piero's, but used to be Villa Diesta. But before that, it was Coachman 6. Could tell a lot of stories, couldn't it? Yes, it could. What was your official, unofficial title? Uh, well, see, that's a myth. <clears throat> Nobody gets titles. Like uh, like a lot of people say, well, you're the bookkeeper, you're this, you're that. You just could, you just do a job. Everything is a job. And my basic job is because I had the expertise of running clubs. I've done that all through Chicago, and that's what Tony knew me for. And, uh, and I worked for all the bosses in Chicago. I, from Jimmy Allegretti to Joe Caesar to Joe the Jap, uh, you name him, I worked for him. And uh, that's why he brought me with him. So you must have been a good operator. Yes, I was. I mean, one of the things that's amazing to me about you is you flew under the radar. How did that possibly happen? Well, because I didn't, basically, a lot of people don't realize it. A lot of people like to be around these guys to get notoriety. And I'm just the opposite. I, I don't need the notoriety. I just needed my paydays. I mean, I was married at that particular time in the 60s. And uh, to be honest with you, nobody that was doing anything illegal ever came to my home. I never introduced my wife to any of them. And we, we'd be out eating in a restaurant. I would never, Tony Splatcher could sit two tables away from me. I wouldn't acknowledge him and he, or he would acknowledge me. I did not go out of the way 
I did mostly everything. I put it in my mind, this is harm's way, so you had to work it that way. Strictly but business. All business. Mm -hmm. That's remarkable. Because the first time I met you was through a gentleman by the name of Ed Becker. Very good friend of mine. He also wrote the uh, All American Mafioso, The Greenfelt Jungle. Yeah, he's a very smart man. He was very intelligent. Uh, Ed Becker uh, was a friend of Ed Reed. Correct. Who was a columnist for the Las Vegas Sun at one time. Correct. But what's interesting to me is, I remember when I met uh, Becker, he always referred to you as he knows all the story about all this stuff about Roselli. And I, what's amazing to me, you never wanted or accepted a credit for helping him do all the research and much of the research in that book. Well, no, because that was different times. We're going back to a lot of people were living then. That's Plus, I didn't need the notoriety. I just needed paydays. But you were a mystery man. You were a mystery man then to me, anyway. Well, I consider myself quiet strength. Well, that's a, explain that. Well, because I could handle myself, and uh, I don't. I didn't have to make any noise to let people know who I am. Like some of these guys, they like to be toughies. They walk in with an attitude. You know, I'm not that kind of guy. You, you played it a different style altogether. Correct. Actually, very much like Roselli. Exactly like Roselli. You're almost like a Roselli, correct. if I may say that. No, correct. You're absolutely And I correct. mean that in all the best of uh, compliments. Correct. I believe that. I. That's exactly correct. Who was another mystery man? Well, that, yeah, but there was a lot of them back home like that. They were all real smooth. A lot of smooth guys back there back home. It's my understanding you're writing a book. Correct. And uh, it, tell us about what your book is about and uh, uh, some of the major points and some of the exciting uh, pieces of it, if you want to. Well, my book starts off when I was a kid of 14 years old, see, but it basically starts off explaining where you're from in the city of Chicago. We came out of an area called the Patch, and they were all Italian immigrants, and uh, lar they all had large families, eight kids, nine kids, and the environment was cr considerably totally corrupted because all the boys in that area would, that's where the 42 gang was created in Chicago, which was led by uh, Sam Giancana, Sam Battaglia, Marshall Cafano, Fat Leonard Cafano, Phil Milwaukee, Aldo Rizzio, all the heavyweights, Chucky Nicoletti, the English brothers. So you're talking about a gang that was a 42 gang, but they were no older than 16. They were like 14 to 16 years old. And they were making so much noise that Al Capone made them join. At that time, it was called the syndicate, not the outfit. He made them, he put them in because they were such a nuisance to him. He said, I'd rather have him working for me than against me. So he brought the 42 gang into his organization. That's how they got started with the syndicate. I know many times when I've spoken to you about the mafia, you've corrected me and said, wait a second, in Chicago it's called the outfit. So, yes, uh, Tony Accardo tagged it. After Tony Accardo took the reins, he changed it from syndicate to outfit, correct. Was Tony Accardo a tough guy? Very tough. <laughs> Are you going to talk about some of these things in your book? Yes, I am. I'm uh, talking about everyone I just mentioned. So it's going to be an exciting book. When's it coming out? I'm hoping to have it out no later than June or the middle of July, but no later. Well, when I was 14 years old, see, Fifi Pachuri lived right around the corner from us. He knew everybody in the neighborhood because everybody worked for him in the neighborhood. And uh, one day he stopped me. He knew my family. He knew my brother because my brother was in the 42 gang with him. Okay. So he come to me and he says, um, Tony, well, they, I had a nickname, Tootsie Boy. And he said, Tootsie Boy, come here. So I said, yeah, Fee, here's a, you want to make $15 a day? I said, yeah. So he says, here's what you do. There was a candy store right there. When we were talking in front of the candy store. I said, here's where you stay every day. And across the street was a, f a condemned factory, which they had the upstairs was a book joint. He said, all you have to do is if you see anything that's irregular, just walk in the candy store, dial the phone, and warn us and you get $15 a day. Now that day only consisted from 12 to 3 because the races were... Wow! Wow! Yes. So that's how that started. And when I became 16, Fat Leonard Cafano grabbed me. Marshall, he was the boss with Sam Giancana. He grabbed me and he says, uh, Tony, I want you to work for me. He said, you know how to drive? I said, yeah. He said, I'm good. So he's, he had this guy with him, Jim Oaks, who was his bodyguard at the time, and uh, Tony Pine, El Dorado, they called him Pineapples. So he's, um, he told Jim Oaks, he explained to Tony what his job would be. 
Because see, one thing people don't realize is bosses don't tell you anything. They'll just introduce you to somebody that will tell, like, explain it to you. So you can never say, well, he told me to do it. You can only say to the person that told you to do it, but you couldn't mention Kafana because he didn't tell me. It was Jim Oaks that told me. So in other words, somebody would tell you to do a job. They put shields in front of them, correct. So it would be like a second, second, third, fourth generation away. Well, they they wouldn't they wouldn't like for example if I came to you and you were a juice man and you were a big juice man and I know you were, and I say I need some money, isn't well go see so and so. You would direct me to somebody even though you're the one that's paying them to lay out the money. I go to so and so, say Rocco Chifo, and uh, Rocco would give me the money. Now, I can't say you gave me the money because you didn't. Rocco Chifo gave me the money, so you're always clear. So, so that's, that's part of their protection. So, so that's just that's interesting. Well, so, I did the same thing as well because you learn it as you're going through it. Like you, you try to avoid everything that could put you in jail. You been in jail? Yes, I have. I got arrested for conspiracy in uh, Las Vegas in 1986. Did you, you got convicted for that? Correct. I even went, uh, I had a full trial, jury trial, because I did nothing wrong, and I wanted to prove my innocence, and my attorney even advised me, he said, Tony, when the government has conspiracy on you, you're going to lose. How many other guys were involved in that? I believe there was 33, 34, but was they were all different areas. They weren't all part of what we were doing. There was only four of us that were considered alpha. The rest were family members selling drugs. They, we were in that business. That was not that was not your thing, was it? Yeah. A lot of uh, Chicago guys didn't like the drug business, did they? Well, you couldn't do it if you were working for them. No way. Because, see, the, the more links you put to a chain, the, leaker, the weaker the chain gets, okay? So what this tells you is when you're dealing with drugs, you got to deal with a lot of links. And somewhere down the line, that link is going to break. The weakest link breaks, right? You're dealing with too many people, yeah. That's one of the theories. But the other theory, they just don't want to get involved in because it just wasn't their business. So there are some myths about the outfit, the mafia, and the syndicate. Well, they're, they're myths because Chicago never had a mafia. The reason they had a syndicate is Al Capone was Neapolitan. You had to be a Sicilian to be a mafia man, so he named it the syndicate. Okay? It's interesting. Yeah. So, so today, with... Uh, uh, all the RICO app and all that stuff. Is there still a syndicate? Still you mean, an, you still mean an are they still organized? No, they're they're pretty much. It's pretty much all over back home in Chicago. It really is. So are much. are these people doing things individually on their own? Some are. I mean, crime's not stopping. No, some are, but they're very foolish because they'll be arrest, arrested in 22 minutes after they commit a crime. The way you're being surveilled. So, so a Shylock can't work on the street anymore. If a Shylock's working, the biggest Shylocks you got in the country are paydays. There's no more independence. Payday loans, you mean? Sure. They're, so, so they're charging 40%. Shylocks are only charging 3 and 10. I hate to tell you it's into triple digits now per year. Well, I'm not counting. It's, it's, it's almost unbelievable. It's right. a fact, uh, it's, I don't know how they get away with it, but they do. Yeah. Uh -huh. So but I once uh, I was once interviewed at the uh, library in Las Vegas. Well, it was this year, 2013, I believe. And um, by the IRS of... Uh, Vegas and the intelligence of Chicago, and I had mentioned it to him. I said, uh, "If you guys, are, what they learned from the Chicago outfit is, they learned the policy became the lottery, the bookies became OTBs, off-track betting powder, juice became paydays." I said, "So, they so were, wait, let's, let's slow down for the for the listeners. So you're saying you're saying that in Las Vegas." Mm -hmm. uh, that Shylock became payday loans or money loans Correct. that you can stop and get a car title loan for. Correct. And the lottery became what? Well, the Belita the lottery. lottery. Was, you, the Belita and policy. Policy was played basically by black people, and Belita was played by Cubans and Mexicans and Puerto Ricans. That turned into? Millions. That turned into the lottery as you know today. Uh, bookmaking became off-track betting parlors. So now I told the gentleman that, I, that was at the, the library, I said, if you guys did this in the 20s, if the government did that in the 20s, you'd have no organized crime in America. So you did learn something from organized crime.